We are so pleased to have Dr. Marco Iacoboni as the speaker for our Mitchell Hochberg public education event. Marco Iacoboni, MD, PhD, is an Italian neurologist and neuroscientist who studied at the University La Sapienza in Rome, Italy. In 1999, he joined the faculty of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and became director of the Neuromodulation Lab at the Amundsen Loveless Brain Mapping Center. Dr. Iacoboni is currently professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine, where he combines brain imaging and non-invasive brain stimulation to study neural systems and mechanisms in humans for sensory motor integration, higher cognitive functions, and social cognition. His long-standing interest in the role of the body in shaping human cognition led him to explore the role of the human mirror neuron system in imitation, empathy, and social communication in health and disease. Dr. Iacoboni is the author of the book for general readers, Mirroring People, the Science of Empathy and How We Connect with Others. The book is the culmination of years of research in his lab on neural mir mirroring in humans and the implications of this brain mechanism for understanding human nature. In his interview about this talk in the group circle, which I hope most of you read, Dr. Iacoboni talked about why he wrote his book on mirror neurons for the general public. Quote, I thought it was a wonderful story that deserved to be told. Science was showing us that human nature is not selfish as we had been taught for centuries, but rather that we are wired for empathy." End quote. Hearing this, it's not surprising that Dr. Iacoboni's bio in the UCLA site about his lab begins with a statement, quote, to be honest, I really don't give a damn about the brain. I care about the human soul. On that lovely note, I will turn the podium over to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Marco Iacoboni, to present his talk like a thought that is also a feeling, the betweenness of empathy. Thank you so much. Um, you guys are a lovely group. I've been interacting with you for only half an hour, and I can see you are very warm people. I have a back story about my little blurb on the website. So we were doing a website for the lab, and every, I asked everybody in the lab to write a little blurb about themselves. Hey, Tom. Yeah, we'll play tennis. <laughs> And one of my senior grad students is now a professor at the US, University of Miami. She told me, do you really want to write that thing on the website? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I think the best thing of the, of the whole talk is the title. When I actually was working, I forgot about gave this title because you asked me about a year ago about this thing. I thought, that's a very good title. I think it's going to go downhill from now on. Okay, so I want to tell you, uh, let's do this, this, uh, uh, this thing this way. I really, I'm a neuroscientist. I like to interact with people like you. I've given many talks to professionals that uh, uh, work in therapy, but I don't really know what you do much, uh, but I do, I, I mean, if there are a couple of things I do, I know it's what I do in the lab. So what I, I suggest to do is that I'm going to really talk about the science and I'm going to try to make it really accessible, not too um, technical. And then in the Q&A, we should really have a conversation about how these concepts, about the science that we've been doing and what we think it means for human nature, maps onto your uh, practice. And that's going to be really where, you know, the the big take home message for both of us, for, for you as a group and also for me, because when I do this Q&A, often I get inspiration to do different kinds of studies. How does it sound? All right, so um, this is the little uh, outline of the talk. I'm gonna start with you know the, the discovery, mirror neurons, and um, the early work we did. Um, then we're gonna talk about 
what, how we study in humans, because the cells were discovered in the monkey brain. Um, but then I want to talk about this concept that mirroring it was, for a few years, was considered, well, you know, you have mirroring, mirror cells, they're nice, they're important, but there's a lot of sounds <laughs> sound in the back. They're important, but I mean, they're short lived, right? I see you falling from a bike and I feel your pain, but it ends there. Whereas when it comes to a more complex form of pro-society, like we heard just a few minutes ago, then you have to have you know, cognition and thinking. And the classical idea is that these two things are separate. And we, what we've been doing in the last five, 10 years in the lab is really to show they're not separate. They seem to be separate, but they actually belong to a much larger integrated system. And they talk to each other all the time. And so the whole idea is that what, we, what I like to talk about is there is a bottom-up mirroring and a top-down control, and they are talking to each other continuously. And in fact, eventually, I want to even get rid of this notion of bottom-up and top-down because I think it's even more integrated than that. But it's, when, you know, when you study complex phenomena, it's good to divide them, separate them, except at some point divisions and dichotomies get in the way of a deeper understanding. Okay, that's the main discovery. Uh, these scientists, incidentally, a lot of people think I'm coming from their lab, but actually I've never done primate work. Uh, every time people say, oh, you're not, you're not coming from the Parma lab that discovered the cells? They say, I wish I was, but... <laughs> uh, I actually ran into Rizzo Lati, which is the head of the lab, just when they did the discovery, I was in Prague, of all places, he was there too for a meeting, and he wanted to also expand the, discovery, you know, the science of mirror neurons in the human brain. But the main discovery, these, these scientists were really studying cells in the monkey brain that controls grasping action. Grasping is such an essential act in our life. We do it all the time. We don't think about it, but actually we grasp things continuously, right? Um, and so understanding how grasping works in the brain can be important also for helping people with brain damage to, reco to recover function uh, when it comes to grasping. So they were studying, they were really after the motor properties of the cells. And what they found was that some of these cells were also responding to just someone else making the action. They were in disbelief initially. They thought this can be true. This got to be some sort of an artifact. In fact, when Rizzolatti, when we actually we wrote a whole grant with the Rizzolatti group, and that's why I started working on this. And I also was a little bit in disbelief. I thought, is it really real? Is it possible this, this just, you know, sometimes it happens in science that you have uh, some ideas and some phenomena that you think are real and then it turns out they are just driven by some confounding factors. Well, this phenomenon was actually confirmed uh, many times. Okay, so that was the, ba the, the basic discovery in the monkey brain, but uh, I do human neuroscience, so I have to study um, this system with human techniques. And even though we can actually now study even individual cells in patients with neurosurgery, that go into neurosurgery, what we tend to do is to study this system with uh, non-invasive techniques. And I'm gonna give you a little list of the three main techniques that we use. One is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It means that we basically place a copper coil encased in plastic on the scalp of people. We push a lot of electricity onto it. We generate a magnetic field. And by doing that, we can stimulate the brain of the participant that is under the coil. So you can stimulate the brain painlessly and non-invasively and study the brain that way. The other one are MEG, EEG. These are techniques to study electrical activity that comes out of the brain. You must know some of that. And then, of course, brain imaging. With brain imaging, we study, we can look at the whole brain. We can see how different regions activate when you do certain things. We can look at your brain at rest, which is also very interesting. So these are the three main markers of mirroring that we use in humans. Um, we can also have these amazing opportunities in which we can study individual cells in the human brain. This is a collaboration I did with my colleague, uh, it's like Fried at UCLA, so he, what he does, he's a neurosurgeon. Some patients with epilepsy do not respond well to the, to the drugs, and they need to be operated. And so what they do, the, the surgeon wants to know where is the focus of epilepsy, because they don't want to remove healthy tissue. They also only want to remove pathological tissue. So the way they do it is that the patient gets into the hospital, 
they take away the drugs, they implant the patient with very large electrodes, and then they, they wait until the patient ceases, and they know where is the, the focus of epilepsy, so they know where to operate. But Isaac and some other neurosurgeons, what they did was to change, to kind of modify the hardware, and they can record also individual cells in the human brain. And we found these mirror cells in humans. We also found mirror cells in areas of the brain, of the human brain, that we did not expect. I have to tell you one thing. When it comes to these kinds of studies, I cannot tell my friend surgeon where to put the electrode. The electrode needs to be located only for medical reasons. Uh, so we were kind of constrained, but in some way we also discover that some areas of the human brain contains mirror neurons in an unexpected region, and we'll talk about that. My main work on mirror neurons started with this paper, um, published 20 years ago, and it's a work that we did because when we started talking to the monkey people and they were telling us about the cells that fire when the monkey makes an action, when the monkey observe someone else making the action, I thought, well, what would you do with this neural machinery in your brain? I thought, imitation. Imitation is such a pervasive behavior. It's important for uh, social connectedness. It's important to learn how to do things, to behave in a context, and environment you don't know well. And yet, this was the very first human study on imitation. Neuroscientists were sort of, you know, scared of trying to tackle this very complex behavior in the lab. One thing we found was that one of the regions that was really important for imitation, it's an area that corresponds in the human brain to the same area in which monkey mirror cells were discovered. In this area, it's a major language area. It's called Broca's area. And so here the idea is that Mirror neurons could be precursors of systems for language through evolution. And that gives you a glimpse of the fact that these cells are very important for communication. But the real communication that we started studying, and we're still studying now, it's the social communication, the one that happens very often also non-verbally. Uh, Celia Ayers, which is a British psychologist who's done a lot of studies on imitation, sent me this paper that by Tanya Shatran and John Barge, when she saw my own paper in, uh, in science, and she told me, look, I mean, there are cl clear links between imitation and empathy. Maybe you should study that. And I had no idea that there was all this literature, especially in psychology. Um, and um, I studied all these things, and I thought, well, let's actually figure out how imitation and empathy are connected in the brain. Oh, Emotional Contagion is a beautiful book. Uh, it's really about experiments in the lab, but it's really, captures all these studies that were done when you know you study you try to understand how emotions get basically caught like viruses from from person to person so the way we did was that well let's think about if mirror neurons are important for if imitation and empathy are connected then in terms of brain system there should be a connection between mirror neurons and your limbic areas your emotional brain centers and so we thought the model that we can think about is a model in which I see a nice smiling face and then my mirror neurons sort of imitate internally that facial expression. But then they send signals to my emotional brain centers so that the emotion that is associated with the facial expression is also evoked in me. So that was the model, and we did a bunch of studies that show that, in fact, there is a whole large circuitry that... Uh, implements this kind of uh, behavior in humans. That's why whenever you see someone smiling, you're kind of happy yourself, and that's why when people, you hang out with depressed people, you also tend to be a little gloomy. <laughs> but I got all this, okay, yeah, that's nice, that's important, but how important it is. After all, what is emotional contagion? It's something that is short-lived, something that doesn't last much, right? Again, I see you in pain, but if I really want to help you, what I need to do is kind of, you know, not just simply have feeling your pain, but also try to uh, be proactive in helping you. And in psychology, it has been the work by Dan Kahneman that really kind of suggested there is this kind of division between a fast thinking, the emotional contagion, the immediate reaction, the mirroring, and then a slow thinking, which is much more deliberate, requires more effort, but it's more flexible. It's not as automatic and knee-jerk as the mirroring. It's a lovely story. 
And in fact, it also appeals to our intuitions because we kind of feel that that's the right description of the way we actually think. Also, in neuroscience, if we look at the data from brain imaging studies, they look at two kinds of behaviors, our mirroring type of behavior, seeing someone in pain and feeling the pain, or expressing emotions with your face, imitating those facial expressions, or more complex tasks, tasks in which you're sort of mentalizing, trying to get yourself into the minds of others from a perspective taking point of view. It kind of, the email, if you make a survey of the literature, it gives you an idea that there are two systems, pretty much like the Dan Kahneman book was telling us. Um, the blue system and the green system in this nice picture, and one is really for mirroring and the other one is more for mentalizing and perspective taking and more sort of deliberate prosocial behavior. It all felt like a very nice story that all the pieces of the puzzle were coming together. Well, we thought it's two systems, but it's just one. What we thought is that while it's one possibility is that what these two large systems are actually talking to each other all the time. It's like, you know, think about you, if you knew nothing about astronomy and you go out and look up in the sky and you just follow the sun in the sky, you're going to think that the sun is rotating around the earth, but it's the opposite. So you can't just, you know, interpret the data as the, yeah, you also have to think of alternative interpretation. So the idea that we had is that, well, if you think in, in evolutionary term, mirroring is something that really it looks simpler and so should have probably come first. And in fact, and there's plenty of evidence of different kinds of mirroring in also in lower species, but whereas other species don't do much mentalizing. Uh, so mirroring is really the bottom-up kind of information that gets fed onto these more higher level coin and control region, the, the ones that determine mentalizing, mind reading, perspective taking. And how do we test this? And oh, and the other thing I want to say is, well, now this is really the, the, the era of connectomics. I mean, the whole neuroscience community is really almost obsessed with connections. And these systems, the ones that I told you about, the mirroring versus the mentalizing, that's on the face of it, they seem separate systems, are actually heavily connected in the brain. So it is plausible that, in fact, they are talking to each other continuously. But the question is, how do you actually test it? Because that's my, you know, my job description is to have hypotheses and to test them in the lab. So we thought, okay, let's do an experiment. We get uh, Katie and we put, put her in the scanner and we show her someone in pain, we show her facial emotional expression, and then we ask her to imitate those expressions. We measure brain activity when Katie's in the scanner and she's doing all these mirroring tasks. So we get a readout of how Katie's brain responds to these kind of situations and sort of mirroring um, scenarios. Then outside the scanner, Katie go, goes to a different room and we tell her, you're going to play an economic game. You're going to be given 24 times $10 and you're going to play with people that exist in real life in LA. And you're going to decide how much money you're going to share with them. So this is a sort of much more type two kind of task in the sense that it's not she's just sitting in front of a computer, she's just getting $10, she's looking at a profile, I'll show you in a second what the profile shows, and then she ponders how much money I'm going to share with this person. So it's not really the knee-jerk sort of mirroring that, you know, our task would um, evoke. Oh, these are all the tasks that she did. Oh, I need to show you this. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that she sees in the scanner. So she sees someone really perceiving pain. And sorry that well, I didn't actually, I should have alerted you, but that <laughs> <laughs> was good, good reaction. <laughs> so we get all this readout, and then Katie goes in this different room and she plays this game. She has 10 bucks, 24 times. She plays with different kinds of profiles. The face and the name, it's not the one that corresponds to the real person for anonymity purpose, but there is a real person with that gender, that sort of age, that, um, and that income. The thing that matters here is the income. So she plays with people that make little money, about twenty to $30,000, and people that make way more, much more money, like 110, 150, 180. 
So this is a good test because we want to know if Katie, when she gives away the money, first of all, I'm surprised that the subjects give anything away. Why don't you keep them all? Because actually they could have done that. But actually, they, uh, I'm the empathy guy, but I'm always out empathized by uh, my participants. So she can decide how much money to share with people. And that's a good test because we know whether she's thinking or not. Because if she thinks, she's going to give more money to people that make less money and much less money to people that make more money because they don't need them. In fact, that's what our subjects tend to do. They tend to, what they tend to do is that with uh, the guy on top that makes $25,000, they tend to split the $10 on average. So they give five to, to that person that makes little money. And with the person at the bottom that makes more than $100,000, they tend to give them one or two dollars top on average which really shows that our subjects are thinking. But the, the real question here, the reason why we did this study is that, let's go back to the, to the notion that we have either two systems or it's one system. If it's one system, when I put Katie in the scanner and she's seeing you know, the person in pain and I read her brain activity, the brain activity that I measure when she sees someone in pain should predict the amount of money that she gives away in this task. If there is a prediction, I mean, if there is a good prediction, that means that these two systems are really talking to each other all the time. It's not that, you know, when I see you in pain, my mirror neurons uh, activate and my control systems are just kicking back and relax because, okay, that's a mirroring task. And when I'm thinking about you in terms of how much money you make, how much I want to share with you, it's not just my current control areas that are activating, but even my mirroring allows me to get into your predicament in a way. And so the idea is that if we have this system, we should see correlation such that what we, what we see in a brain scanner predicts the amount of money that Katie gives away. And of course, we got that to my own surprise, I must say. And what we found is that, I mean, classical emotional brain areas, do we have a pointer? Oh, I can use my finger. Can I use my finger? I should be able to. No, forget it. <laughs> oh, sorry. I mean, classical emotional brain, like the amygdala, um, those two little dots um, at the bottom of the brain, on top, in red, those are areas that are, it's a classical emotional brain centers, and the more money Katie gives away at the game, the more active that region is when Katie sees someone in pain. So there's a nice direct correlation that suggested indeed these mirror responses are actually predicting also your much more complex and thoughtful behavior when it comes to prosocial behavior. And the ones in blue, these are classical cognitive control regions, and they show an inverse correlation. That is, the more active they are in Katie's brain when she sees someone in pain, the less money she's going to give away. She gets stingy if her control regions get really active when she sees someone in pain. So that correlation was a lovely correlation. I was actually surprised that it was, came, they came out so nicely because, you know, I thought, let's do the experiment, but maybe this stuff is not going to pan out. But correlation is not causation. I mean, there may be my favorite story about correlations in statistics is the story that, if you, I don't know if it's still true, but, you know, if you read, read book of statistics many years ago, a classical example, you get a bunch of cities in the United States, and the number of crimes and the number of churches correlate. Why is that? Because it's the population that really is the, the, the driving factor. The more people there are, the more churches, the more crimes there are. So correlation is really not causation. You really have to understand correlation better. And uh, we have another tool now in neuroscience to actually interrogate the brain in a way that is more causally um, related to the behavior that we want to understand. And it's called brain stimulation. Um, and this type of brain stimulation is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So again, as I told you, what we do is that we, we have a coil that we can push a lot of electricity and we, we stimulate the brain and we can actually impair transiently a brain region uh, when we do that. So the question is, if we stimulate these areas that are in, the, in Katie's brain, the control areas, the ones that when they're active, they actually make her stingy, can we make her more generous? 
that would be really the demonstration that this activity in the brain, when Katie is looking at someone in pain, that predicts her generosity, is causally related to, the, to her prosocial behavior. Right? So far so good? Yes. Um, and TMS is a very powerful thing to show you how powerful it is. I'm going to show you a little clip in which a grad student was in the, we were, we read about this you know, study and we thought, let's do it in the lab. Um, this is a grad student, fabulous grad student. He'll be a star in psychology. And uh, we're stimulating his language center while he's reading a book on transcranial magnetic stimulation. That was you know, the meta aspect. <laughs> and you're going to see that his speech, his, this is a, I was at his subject, his speech will be impaired. In fact, it's so impaired the two times that he gets stimulated that we wanted to do this multiple times and after the second time, okay, that's enough. Please stop. <laughs> with electromagnetic energy, transcranial magnetic stimulation to see what happens when searching the tradition of studying individuals with brain injuries to see what impairments are associated with specific sorts of damage. What these studies do, in essence, is find out what <laughs> okay, that's probably good. It's <laughs> completely freaking out. <laughs> You're making me a physic. Okay, so that's the power of TMS. TMS can really transiently disrupt activity in the brain. So we're doing this thing now on Katie's brain in those regions that the more they're active, the more she gets stingy because we want to make her more generous. And we're testing the hypothesis that the, the correlation that we see between her brain activity when she, she sees you in pain and how much money she's going to give away in charity are actually causally related. And we do this you know, with TMS and we have to do control conditions because there is all sorts of different things. But we control for all these things and what we do get you don't have to actually get into the details of the slide, is that people become more generous. We have three areas, one that has nothing to do with you know, the control system, and two groups that are stimulated in control areas that show this inverse correlation, and they actually, we actually are able to make people more generous. We entitled the paper Increasing Generosity by Disrupting Prefrontal Cortex, and then NPR ran a story on our study, and called the story, How to Make an Altruist. And I thought, that's such a better title than ours. So, but this really gives you a sense that in fact, when you, your mirroring capacity also reflects your capacity to have control and to have more, much more prosocial deliberate behavior. These are not two separate things. Uh, okay, the thing about contextual versus tonic inhibition, it's a little, we can skip that. But the beauty of it is that now we can combine two different techniques, brain imaging and brain stimulation. With brain imaging, we can actually describe systems, but then with brain stimulation, we can actually test whether you know, there is a causal relation between a given system and a given behavior. And this makes me think of this guy, David Foster Wallace, who was actually, who spent the last years of his life in Southern California, he was teaching in Pomona. He was a fabulous writer. He was also the poster child of how we are failing with depressed patients because he killed himself. And all of the depressed patients are actually were not treating them well. And he wrote this thing about tennis practice in which he said at some point, that tennis practice seems cruel to the observer because they do this repetition, these shots over and over again. But it helps the, the player because, in fact, the more you do it, the more what you do recedes back, back from, from consciousness. That was David. And then he concludes, it's like a thought that is also a feeling. It's a train. <laughs> It's like a thought that is also free. And I think that's the way I think about, in fact, it could be the title of my next book. It's, that's the way I think about, it's my slide that makes this? Maybe. Let's test it. It's not a slide.
So this notion that you have these emotional brain centers and these much more cognitive brain centers, they're actually talking to each other and forming an integrated system. And the integrated system, thank you for the silence, the integrated system is really like a thought that is also a feeling. There is also there is both the emotional and the rational aspect of it. But then my question is, I really want to understand causal mechanisms. It's a nice story, and I was actually surprised that it came out so nicely, but I want to understand how does it, how is it that when I play a game, when Katie, the German participant, <laughs> plays the game and just looks at a completely neutral face and just sees the name, the gender, how much money that person makes, and decides on the face of it, just, you know, I'm going to give him five bucks or two dollars. From a phenological standpoint, it doesn't seem that we're really living through all these emotions and empathic uh, connections. And yet, how is it, is it that her brain activity in the scanner predicts how much money she gives away? And to me, the answer, at least a very vague and approximate answer, is that memories are what really matters here. Is that in order, when mirroring allows us to have all these interactions with people. We interact, we form these very automatic, pre-reflective forms of uh, connections, but they sediment in our memories, and they become something that then at some point become the weights of our decision making when we actually operate at a much more uh, rational uh, level. And the reason why also I, I sort of I'm inclined to think that memories are very important for this, it's because in our neurosurgery study, what we found was that cells in the medial temporal cortex, which is an important area for memory, we found mirror cells. The lead uh, author of that study was a postdoc at that time. He's now a professor at Tel Aviv University. He came to my office one day with this beautiful raster of the mirror cells, and I asked him, oh, wow, that's a great, mirror, great looking mirror cell. Where is it? In which area of the frontal lobe? Because the frontal lobe is the area that contains the, uh, these centers for motor behavior that could be mirror. And he tells me, no, it's in the entorhinal cortex, which is an area of the medial temporal lobe, which is important for memory. I look at him and I say, Roy, are you nuts? How can it be in the medial temporal cortex? That area, it's, we know it's important for memory, but doesn't have motor properties. And he tells me, Marco, what can I tell you? Data be data. I didn't believe him. Uh, I told him, uh, you probably must have mislabeled the, the, the letter. Why don't you go back and check? He comes back, he says, I didn't make any mistake. Still don't believe him. But then we saw this over and over again. And that's uh, one of the beauty of science, right? The science, when, when it, your data contradicts your belief over and over again, at some point you get to change your beliefs. And so here we have evidence that indeed there are mirroring happens also in our memory areas. And how does it work? So the idea is that when I see you grasping the, the, the glass of water, I not only mirror with your, my motor cells, I also mirror your action with my memory cells. Because whenever I grasp a, gra a glass of wine, <laughs> would be better. <laughs> Not only are my dopamine neurons and my grasping cells activating, but also are my memory cells sort of making the memory trace of myself making that action. So the mirror, mirror the more we study, the more it becomes really rich and powerful. Okay, so the last, the last thing I want to share with you, we wanted to push this even more. Okay, we show that in fact mirroring sort of predicts generosity, which is Pretty amazing, and we actually show it's really causally related to it. But what about thorny moral dilemmas? Moral dilemmas are something that uh, moral philosophers like to, to play a lot with, and some of them are really tough. I mean, the, one of the most classical ones is that you are at war, and you are villagers, and the soldiers of the enemy are invading your village. You're hiding because otherwise you're going to get all killed, and there is a baby with you, and the baby starts crying. What do you do now? Because the baby cries, the soldiers may actually hear the baby crying, and they may kill everyone. Are you going to smother the baby? Yes or no? Some people say, no way. I don't care what's going to happen, but I actually believe in the morality of the action, so I refuse to do it. Some other, some other people say, well, 
After all, if I don't smother the baby, everybody will be killed, including the baby. So why don't I smother the baby? That's a decision made in terms of the morality of the outcome of your action, not of the action itself. Uh, so we did a study, and the study was very similar to the ones that I showed you earlier, which you know, people go in the scanner, and then they make it an economic game. In this case, they go in the scanner, and then they play the dilemmas. And the question is whether the activity in the brain, when we see someone in pain, predicts the decisions that they make in these thorny dilemmas. And by the way, these thorny dilemmas are not just hypothetical stuff. This was the um, rationale for bombing Japan during World War II. It's a utilitarian decision. America used the bomb in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands. So it's, that's a really something that happens in real life. So we do the study, participate in the scan, and then they play the dilemmas, and we do get correlations between a classical mirror neuron area in the inferior frontal gyrus and their dilemma decisions. That really tells us that even a simple action like watching someone in pain and the way you respond to it is in some way related to much more complex decisions you make in life, including making a decision about these really thorny moral dilemmas. Okay, I'm going, this is my last slide, and I'm going to shut up, and you're going to ask me questions. So let's go back to it. So it's like a total is also a feeling. I like this sentence a lot because it really combines these two things that we think are often separated in emotions and uh, rationality. Um, to me, our work in the last five or six years suggests that this divide between what we think is like the fast thinking, just having these knee-jerk responses, and a much more deliberate slow thinking, it's more like an illusion. It's like when you see the sun going around the earth and you think it's the sun rotating around the earth. And the other thing I want to say is that that suggests that thinking about people is really grounded into the sensory motor experiences that you have with people. So when I think about this guy makes a lot of money, so I'm just giving him one dollar. That decision is also grounded in my own, in my own you know, sort of experiences. And there is a continuous interaction between this bottom-up and these top-down processes. In fact, now we are pushing the envelope even more. I haven't shown you the data because I don't want to overload you with data. But we have a paper that we just we have just written up that shows that if you look at these two systems, the control system and the mirroring system, when the, cell, the participants are in the scanner doing nothing, the, active, the pattern of activity in these two systems and the way they interact with each other predicts the amount of empathy that the subject has. So I can put a skating in the scanner and tell, tell her how empathic she is just by looking at your brain activity. Okay, it's a little less cartoonish than this, but... <laughs> Okay, what's the long-term goal? Well, how does it really work? Really, I want to understand how it works, so that's going to be my next uh, 10 years obsession. But also, how does psychopathology change it? That's, you know, I'm in the psychiatry department, and the, the upshot of all this research for us is really to try to understand mental health and its disorders. And with this, I'm done. Thank you. Either it was too clear or not clear at all. <laughs> yeah. We have the mic coming up here. Thanks, Angela. Thank you very much. A question. If mirror neurons are associated with pro-social behavior, um, what increases or diminishes an individual's allotment of mirror neurons? Are there activities, experiences, early life uh, influences that improve people's capacity, or is it something we're born with and we're fixed? Well, I would say that pretty much everything we have we're really looked into in detail, and we were thinking it was 
you were born with it and if it was fixed, it's been shown that it's not such a thing. The, the, the brain is very plastic, it can change. When I went to med school, the dogma was that after you hit 25, you can only lose neurons. That was also wrong. Now we know you can actually, your brain can regenerate neurons. Um, so I would say that, yeah, what is, to me, the key thing is really be attuned to other people and being attuned, especially with the nonverbal communication. Um, I don't know how much you, you must, I mean, you must be a bunch of empathic people, right? Uh, I tend to be empathic too. I really like even to just watch people, to get, you know, to get to, to try to understand what's going on in their mind just by looking at them and what they do, or, uh, how they behave, what's their facial expressions. Um, certainly a nurturing environment is going to make your mirroring capacities much better than an environment that is not nurturing, that is impoverished, that it's uh, um, too rigid. Uh, uh, that separate people. Um, so all, all these experiences are important. Early in life, they're more important than later on in life. But I would say the neuroscience is telling us that there is always time to correct things. Um, certain early life experiences may be really tough to change. But again, now, I mean, at least when I went to med school, the dogma was that you can only lose neurons, so there's no way you're going to, after you hit a certain age, you're not going to rewire your brain. Now we know that that was wrong. So there is always a hope that you actually can actively change certain types of behavior that are not as empathic as you would like. Can't hear you. That's correct. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't have this profession. Is this an infomercial? <laughs> So I'm wondering what the implications are for psychotherapy in that we're often uh, in the situation where people have a feeling that they know is not logical, that they continue to react in a certain way while their logic, their top down says, you know, I'm not really being rejected or I'm not, you know, th there's a more rational feeling that doesn't seem to connect with the bottom up thinking. Yeah, I mean, I'm not negating that. That's actually the reason why when we zap Katie's brain in those regions, we're going to make her more generous because there's all this continuous interaction between the two. But what's important to remember is that these two systems are not in opposition. They are, in, they are integrated systems. And that's why you really have to also not only nurture your mirroring, but also nurture your control. Kind control is a, it's an important thing. It's a good thing. That's why also I like that sentence, it's a, it's a thought that is it's also a feeling. Because kind control is often framed in the sense of being rational and cold. But in fact, that's, not, that's, that's the kind of bad control that it's getting out of control in a way because it's squashing emotions. The, the best thing is to actually integrate in uh, your emotional life with your rational life. I have a point. Um... It, it can't be an all or none phenomenon. That is, the, whether it can't be an all or none phenomenon for each and every one in the audience here. There has to be an attentional mechanism that motivates things differently for how people attend to this response. And do you control for that in the experiment? Because that's, McChrystal, that's, McChrystal that's, talks about that. That's a beautiful question. In fact, it's such a, such a beautiful question that you know I was asking my. Even in the monkey brain, I says, wait a minute, so we have these cells that fire when the monkey sees someone making an action, but you guys are always around the lab. Should, why the cell doesn't fire all the time? Well, no, but you have to be in front of the monkey, and the monkey needs to pay attention to you. So, yeah, of course, attention modulates that. I mean, attention is really the gatekeeper of processing. If, you don't, if I don't look at you, my, my favorite story about, you know, why there may be a, a deficit in mirroring in autism is because there is this evidence that babies that eventually will develop autism, they don't look at people. And my way of thinking about how you develop mirror neurons is because I'm the baby, you're the caregiver, I'm smiling, and the caregiver automatically smiles back at the baby. And so here a mirror, mirror neuron is born just by associating my motor plan for smiling with the sight of you smiling. But if I'm not looking at you, there's no way I can form the mirror neuron. Just a second point in argument. This gentleman, just one second. Um, the, um, let me get my thoughts straight. Um, 
Well, oh yes, uh, the mind-body problem is embedded in this in this protocol. Um, soma and psyche, for some researchers, are the same, and there's no difference between what is mind and what is body. And in this experiment, I think to answer this uh, woman's question is that introspective empathy is not equally distributed with everybody. And that go that's not exactly attention. It takes something else to be introspectively emp empathic to different types of people. So it raises some fascinating questions about how this does what does not translate into to psychotherapy. Okay, I, I, I think I understood half of the things you were saying, so I'm not sure how to answer. But uh, yeah, one thing I got, I got is that you're saying that empathy levels are different between people. That's for sure. I mean, that's, uh, in fact, I mean, we're making sort of average of activity, but even within our little economic game, some people were really stingy and some people were very generous. <laughs> Mirror neurons uh, imply that you have to see someone in order to feel empathy. However, when we read a book, we can feel empathy. Is it mirror neurons? Yeah, well, I mean, the main finding was in, in, with the, in the visual domain, so most of the studies are done in the visual domain, but we know the mirror cells respond also to, say, auditory stimuli. And now we know that there are mirror responses even for touch. So it's, these cells are really multimodal cells. That's the way we like to call them, because they seem to be coding actions of the self and other people in multiple modalities. So it's not that you have, it's not that if you're blind, you're screwed, and you don't have empathy. <laughs> there are three aspects of the mirror neuron activity. Where, where is it? Oh. That I'm interested in. Um, what's the range? Is there a latency? How long is it retained? And can it be transmitted to others? What? The, the experience of the mirror neuron. Well, experiences, we know they're, they're contagious. They're so contagious, they're, there's a good thing about it, there's also a bad thing about it, because also, also violent behavior is contagious. We know that very well. Um, when it comes to what, what's the range, what do you mean? Oh, well, good question. Um, I would say the closer the better, but doesn't need to be, I mean, close proximity is not absolutely necessary. Um, because there is, I mean, exactly, I mean, you can have different kinds of, uh, and even I'm, I've been asked a lot about social media. You know, oh, okay, but then social media is bad because social media, they, you know, you can actually text rather than talking to each other. But in fact, one can make an argument that you can use your mirror, mirroring also to sort of have some, some sort of imagery of the person you're interacting with. And the beauty of social media and technology is that I can talk to people that are in New Zealand, which I wouldn't be able to talk to. Um, so, I mean, there is a good thing about it. There is also a bad thing, because then if you rely too much on those kinds of uh, interactions rather than face-to-face -face interactions, that, that could be a problem. Up, hands up. I do a lot with anxiety. I was wondering what your thoughts are about the implications of anxiety with activating your marriage. Yeah, I mean, if you do anxiety and you do group therapy, good luck to you because I think anxiety is one of those things that also gets transmitted and it may be actually amplifying in small groups of people that are all anxious. But again, one could leverage the notion of mirroring. It, became, it can become a vicious circle, but it can become a virtuous circle. So if you actually are able to, at least with some of your clients, to dampen down the anxiety, then the others may actually see that and respond to that and do that too. I'm wondering if the mirror neurons downregulate. So in your studies... I need to know where, where the... Per oh, okay. <laughs> In your studies with um, people observing other people in pain, if they repeatedly observe someone in pain, do they stop responding? So in other words, is one of the differences that people actually just turn them off? Yeah, that's actually an important, it's a, it's a big problem in medical school, medical school because there is a phenomenon of burnout in third year medical school students. Um, yeah, the experience we do, we need the repetitions because it's for statistical reasons. But ideally, yeah, you don't want to, 
expose people to violence or people in pain for too long, then there is desensitization, there is... Ben also, there are different kinds of responses. Some people tend to just to withdraw, some others are really tired, burn out, um, some people actually become more compassionate, and in a lot of it has to do with how, again, the top level and the, down, the bottom level interact with each other, and that's the kind of stuff I want to study for my next 10 years. I think it's important to think about mirroring in terms of reverberations, like domino, because it goes in it goes and it comes back, and it's a reciprocal and also reverberation, reverberating. So it's like uh, what you see or what you don't see, or what you, what you uh, are mirrored and what you're not mirrored, and it depends who you're in front. So, and, and how much you can take in what's coming back to you. And yeah, totally. Back and forth. Yeah, in fact, I mean, human interactions can be can be can break down very quickly if the other if one of the two interacting people, or if we're talking even more than two, uh, becomes more withdrawn or becomes sort of uh, less responsive. It, they're really fragile in in their the regard. When it comes to the reverberation, there is also the sort of a, again this aspect of well, spiraling. And again, to me, one of the worst examples is when you have this sort of. Uh, gang sort of behavior when people, especially men, young men, tend to gang up together and they tend to, to do this very violent act because they're, they're feeding into each other's sort of rage and uh, being out of control. Yep. Right here. Um, I hope I understood what you explained um, in my question. Uh, I'm recalling various sociological studies I read about in college where people responded with empathy more with people who resembled them than with people who did not resemble them. And therefore, as far as generosity, they would give more generously to someone who looked like they didn't actually really need it, to someone who actually looked like they were in great need. If they were approached on the street with someone who was very poor, they gave a small amount. If they were approached and asked for money by someone who was well-dressed, who said they needed something, they were much more willing to give them something that was larger because that person resembled them more. I'm wondering if that shows up at all in your studies. Well, I mean, of course, we haven't done all the possible combination of studies, but certainly the, the main take-home message is that there are all these interactions within top-down control and bottom-up. I mean, for instance, that thing we know well is that empathy, it's an important thing, but it drops down dramatically for people that do not belong to your social group. We are really good at empathizing with people like us. We are really not that good at empathizing with people that we think are not like us. But, the thing, but what does it mean to be like us? I mean, that's what, that's, I mean, the upshot of it is that we've done actually studies on that. We've done studies on race and empathy. But the upshot of it is that Social groups are flexible. I like to cite my old friend and uh, old ancestor, Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor, who wrote in, in his meditation, when I think about myself as Marcus, I think about my, uh, my city, Rome. But if I think about myself as a human being, my city is the whole world. Well, uh, my question is actually, uh, can we build down the question just now? Is um, I don't know if I have missed this detail of your research, like because I saw the material you used in experiment are uh, the faces of uh, people of color, and I don't know if you have data about um, the participants' um, ethnic ethnicity and how that, like, have you controlled this variable and how that speaks to the result, like how people yeah, because. If, um, if we need to turn on certain part of our own memory to um, be like empathic to people, so I just wonder like how seeing the people, the, the same face of your own race um, is a matter. Okay, so the, the first part of the answer is about repeating what you know, other people have shown in psychological studies that anybody really can drop dramatically for people that do not belong to your social group. You can even generate artificial groups that are meaningless. I can invite you as participant in my, say I'm a psychologist, I invite you to in, in my lab, and I give half of you 
blue uh, t-shirts and half of you red t-shirts. I'm going to immediately, this, this is called the artificial group paradigm, and it generates within minutes the same dynamics that you get for in-group and out-group members in total strangers. Um, we have done studies on imitating very meaningless gestures and looking at the effect of the race of the person you're imitating, and the effects are pretty dramatic in the sense that we're not, you know, we aren't collecting any kind of data in terms of evaluating the person. They were just looking at people, making this New Zealand sign language that no one knows, um, and they were just imitating this stuff, but whether the, the skin color of the, and they were Caucasian and African American are the participants, and whether the skin color was Caucasian, African American, or Asian, we were getting really different brain responses. That tells you there is something pretty much entrenched in the kind of response we give. Uh, when we think about you, when we interact with people. But that's because, you know, society has been built that way. But we can change it. I mean, to me, the message is that all these things are, they can flexibly changed, can be flexibly changed. And that's because we know that the brain is plastic. So there are different ways in which you can do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, on, on the economic game, we have faces of different ethnicity, but we need way more subjects in order to really look at what's the role of ethnicity in generosity. But we do expect to get those, in the sense that those are well-known phenomena, that you tend to be more generous, more empathic with people that uh, are like you. So I, I think we have one, Charlie, I know that you have had, held the mic. One, one quick last question. Okay. Actually, this is for you, Karen. Just wondering if you thought about getting a TMS machine for out by the raffle ticket booth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll run to West so then come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. I kind of like more like positive emotions rather than negative ones. But uh, I mean, one of the problems with neuroscience is that when a paradigm works well, we tend to stick with it because you know, these studies cost so much money. <laughs> you know, we have no idea. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we haven't done studies like that, but it's one of the things I also want to do to get more into the positive uh, emotion domain. But that, that set of stimuli, we knew from other groups that we used them for doing really and in fact, I mean, I still kind of cringe when I say it because it's a powerful stimulus. But no, I, I would expect not very different responses. Certainly you want to have stimuli that engage the, your participant. Because after all participants, I mean, there's a whole aspect of the way we do studies is that uh, one of the reasons why I think that my participants are so generous when they play the game is that they feel good about themselves. They say, well, I mean, going to a brain center and being a participant of a brain study and doing something that is for the greater good. And so then they feel that, oh, by the way, when we do those games, the subject is alone in the room and the subject is told, no one is going to look at your data that knows your name. They will, your data will be de-identified and analyzed without your name and uh, you'll be alone. Why? Because if I'm looking at Katie playing the game, and she's playing with this $25,000 dude, and she keeps all the money. I'm thinking, she's very greedy, and she cares about my, my, my opinion of her. So we have to do all these controls, but we do those. Um, so I mean, it's, yeah, it's one of those things that we want to expand to, but it takes a while to do these things. I have the terrible job of stopping you. Oh, no, no one stops me. And so, <laughs> um, as group therapists, we, we aim to start on time and oh. end on time. Oh, As one of my mentors <laughs> said, do yourself a favor, do your client a favor and start on time. Do yourself a favor and end on time. So let us give a final round of applause. <laughs>